So let's go to this, this Nehemiah reading. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 9 through 22. And again, I'm sorry this is long, but you've got to hear what God is saying through this, through Nehemiah. Now, a little bit of a story. Remember that we had the, the exile. And they were sent off, the Israelites, first this northern kingdom goes in about the 8th century B.C., the southern kingdom goes in about the 6th century B.C., and they're, they're spread across where, where the northern kingdoms were just scattered across all the world, and they're just kind of gone. Judah, Benjamin, were moved to Babylon during that exile. One more time. Pardon me? The, the scripture? Nehemiah chapter 9. Verses 9 through 22. And so what happened was, um, the king at the time, Cyrus, if I'm not mistaken, made a decree. He was very open to plural, religious pluralism in his kingdom. And so basically he told the Israelites, look, okay, so you're in my kingdom now and you've been here for so long. I'll tell you what, go ahead and go on back and you can rebuild the temple of Jerusalem. Which... For a lot of people, it was very disconcerting, those folks that were living in Jerusalem at the time, because they knew that they were going to basically be kicked out, and this maybe this kingdom ascends again to its power. But anyway, this little ragtag bunch of folks, with a little bit of support from this king, go back, right? Scared to death with all these people around the area that are not, don't want them. Now. And they start to rebuild, they start to rebuild the temple with Nehemiah and Ezra. Ezra the priest and Nehemiah the official. And here Nehemiah, they're before the people of God, and he recounts the great things that God has done so that they can then make a commitment to God again and begin to rebuild the temple. And this is where this is at. But this is going to talk about what we are going to talk about in a bit about this journey. We're getting there, I promise. We need to... We need to set some things up so we understand what's going on. So when we enter into the journey, we don't get swallowed up in other details. Okay? Very important. So I'll just read this aloud. If you're there, please read along. And you saw the distress of our ancestors in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea. You performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they had acted insol insolently against our ancestors. You made a name for yourself, which remains to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they passed through the sea on dry land. But you threw their pursuers into the depths like a stone into mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day with a pillar of cloud and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the way in which they should go. You came down also upon Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right ordinances and true laws good statutes and commandments. And you made known your holy Sabbath to them and gave them commandments and statutes and a law through your servant Moses. For their hunger you gave them bread from heaven and for their thirst you brought water for them out of the rock. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you swore to give them. But they and our ancestors acted presumptuously and stiffened their necks and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you had performed among them. But they stiffened their necks and determined to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you did not forsake them. Even when they cast an image of a calf for themselves and said, This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies, you, in your great mercies, did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud that led them in the way did not leave them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night that gave them light on the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them, and did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, so they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. The story of the Exodus is a story of God's love, God's elective love for His people. 
They didn't choose him. He chose them. They didn't choose him. He chose them. And every time they acted in the way that we're going to see how they acted, God never rejected them. God never stopped doing good to them. God never abandoned them to the wilderness. Yeah, we're going to see there's consequences. <laughs> there's consequences here. It's not like God is, a friend of mine calls it, I love this, this is one of my favorites. He calls it the senile grampification of God. Right? The senile grampification of God, right? The grandpa we all want that when we come in, he says, Well, how you doing, son? Well, geez, grandpa, I got a DUI a couple weeks ago, spent three nights in jail. Oh, great, here's a 50. I hope you're just, I just want you to have That parent that just really wants us, that's going to allow us to do whatever we want, whatever how base that is. That's how we want God, but God's not like that. God calls us in love to Himself. He wants what's best for us. So we have to know that when we act unfaithful to God, He still remains faithful. Okay? Okay. So we need to talk a little bit about... Let me see where I'm at here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we can go 30 minutes in one slide. We're in trouble. We're fine. Um, we need to talk about 40. The number 40. Because they're going to be in the wilderness... For 40 years. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert. We spend 40 days in the great fast. Okay? And there was a great insight for me to listen, read a thing that Pope Benedict put out um, for the last, during the last great fast. That I want to read this to you. It's a little quote for him about the number 40, what it represents. Because again, it's going to frame this idea of wilderness that we're going through. Okay, here it is. He says, it is a number that expresses the time of waiting. And for us Americans who, man, we want to touch the button, and it better be on, and it better be doing what we want. I mean, I've watched you know, people that maybe aren't so literate in computers, and that's what they think they're supposed to. You know, and they sit there and they click on it once. And, <laughs> and then it's not working, and you're like, yeah, now how will anybody do put like 28 clicks in the buffer, 2,000 clicks in the buffer, wait. But that's how we act, right? It's like, I mean, don't you feel that way? It's like, he clicked, it's like, I, I, that, was a, that was an eight milliseconds and it's on? God doesn't work like that, folks. Spirituality isn't that. So already we have a problem, right? Already we have a tension with the way that we think and the way that God's gonna move, okay? So it is a number that expresses a time of waiting, of purification, of return to the Lord, of knowledge that God is faithful to His promises. It indicates a patient perseverance, a long trial, a sufficient length of time to witness the works of God, and a time when it is necessary to decide to accept one's responsibilities without further delay. It is a time for mature decisions. It's time for us to grow up as Christians. That's my invitation to you today, that we get off expecting God to treat us like a three-year-old. That doesn't mean independence of God when you grow up. It means more dependence. It means that the stability that the child has becomes much more unstable in a way when we're a mature Christian because we're relying on God, not on the stability of the structures around us. It's a time for trust. I love, you know, it's kind of like how many of us do this, right? We're like, okay, God, I have this problem. And, and, and I'm so scared and it really bothers me. It's really a big one, God. Can, I'm going to give it to you. Take care of it for me, please, okay? And we... Don't... And he's like, we, okay, let go. And we're like, okay. Jeez, aren't you going to do anything with that thing? I gave it to you. I mean, geez, I gave it to you. You didn't do anything. It's been, what, 45 seconds? Come on, God. Okay, I'm gonna, let me give this to you again. Now you need to do something with it because this is really a big thing for me, right? And we hand it back, and he's like, that's going to kind of pull it out of our hands because we, right? And he holds it for a couple seconds, and we grab it back again. 
The number 40 doesn't allow, the wilderness doesn't allow us to do that. Because in the wilderness right here it says, a sufficient length of time to witness the works of God. So this 40, this time that we spend in this wilderness is a time of waiting, of patience, of trust. That we give God space to work in our life. We don't demand that He move at this moment when we want Him to. He'll move when it's time, no doubt about it. And oftentimes to prove that, God lets us hang to where we're right at the, and He catches us, right? How many times, I don't know how many times I can tell you that money gets down to the last penny and it starts to go negative and out of the blue money shows up. I mean, that's happened to me so many times it's embarrassing that I don't trust God and I'm not saying it. I should be. The way He's treating me, I should be. No, no. My fault. Okay? So we have the 40. Now we have the wilderness. We need to talk about this wilderness. And we've really been talking about this, so I can move through this very quickly. This is a place of God showing us, this is a time of first love with God out in the wilderness. Without the distractions of Egypt. It's like this retreat in a way, right? There's this beautiful day outside. We push everything aside. Why? To come here so that we can listen to God and He can tell us of His great love for us. That's what this wilderness is about. That's what the wilderness was for them. The Lord says He calls them in Exodus chapter 4. He calls Israel His firstborn son. In Exodus 19, He says that He wants to make them a nation of priests, a holy nation. He wants to give them Him. I will be your God, and you will be my people. That's what God wants. Through everything, through the whole time. So everything that God does is ordered to that. Ordered to bring them to Him. Okay? And that's this time where He teaches us about Himself. This time that He feeds us man. That He teaches us His law. What's interesting though about the manna, what, even in the manna there's a lesson. Because what happened with the manna? It falls from heaven how many times a day? Once. How many times can, how many days of manna can you gather at a time? One day, except on Friday, you can get two because you've got to cover the Sabbath. If you got two days, what happened? It rotted. So right here already, God is not, God is taking these people out of this place of seeming stability, which it's not because it's slavery. And He's pulling them out to say that stability is me. It's not the thing, it's me. And I'm going to train you in that by giving you food one day at a time. How many of us would abide in that for very long? How many of you today, if you had a million dollars in the bank, if I wrote you a check that you knew was good, cashier's check for a million bucks, and you put that you won the lottery, how many of you would feel more stable? Come on. Every one of us, let's be, let's be honest. <laughs> Trust in the bank more than God. Trust in the bank more than God. Trust in the stuff more than God. And see, the Lord wants to move us away from that and move us into instability. Or seeming instability. Because the seeming instability makes us rely on Him as the one thing that's stable. Do you see that movement? And we'll talk about that in their story in a minute. But another thing about it, the wilderness is a time of great temptation and trial. Because it's in the wilderness that our relationship to God is laid bare. It's in the wilderness that we're challenged to believe. You know, it's really easy to sit by your, on your big, comfy, fluffy chair with a snifter of brandy by a warm fire and talk about the martyrs. <laughs> right? Oh yeah, I can go here. If I have a golly, if I was over there, no, I see my Right? And then you walk out there and God gives you a challenge that's that big and you scream and fall on the ground and flop around like a little baby, right? Pitching a fit. So out in the wilderness, things get really stark. It's life or death. 
It's God or rebellion. It's trust or it's fear. And it's important for us to understand that because this because then this wilderness becomes a place of great choosing on our part. Not, hear what I said, choosing. I didn't say seeing. I said choosing. I didn't say seeing. Because St. Paul in 2 Corinthians tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight, correct? We want to walk by sight because that's the easy thing. But actually, walking by faith is the most assured thing. Why? Can God lie? No. Can God deceive? No. Can God be wrong? No. So what God says is perfect. And we can walk that path then, unafraid. But when we demand to see, how many of us, you know, we have these thoughts of, oh, God would never ask me to do that. Oh, no, if he ever asked me to do that, well, I'd lose my faith. Really? then you must not have faith or very much. You need to pray for more. I need to pray for more. Because the Bible tells us that God's ways are higher than our ways and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So if God would ask us of something, you know, for example, have you ever heard of Gideon? Right? Gideon was in the book of Judges and God called him to go and attack the Moabites? I can't remember. I'm sorry, anyway. Attacked this other people, but God wanted it so that they knew it was God doing it, not them. So there, were, so this huge army was amassed, and God kept paring it down to so Gideon and a few other guys against like ten thousand. Why? Because God wanted Gideon to know that it was God doing it and not them. But how many of us would say, "Oh, but He wouldn't want me to do that"? Abraham sacrificing Isaac. How many of us would say, "God would never ask that of ever"? So I'm. No. Think about the early church when you were asked to pinch a little incense before the statue of Caesar. Let's face it, everybody knew that Caesar wasn't God. They weren't stupid back then. As much as we try to portray them as stupid, those are the days of Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. These folks were smart. They knew that Caesar wasn't God, but because of the fact of the state needing to have the religious aspect for obedience, you said he was, you treated him as the God. So you had to go and pledge your allegiance in worship to, this, the, to Caesar, thus the state. And how many Christians died because of it? But I think modern American Christians would say, oh, you know what, I have a family. God would never want me to leave the family. How will they be provided for? You know what I'll do? I'll just think, I'll just have a mental reservation, right? I'll go up there and say, no, God, I'm really not doing this. I'm really not, I'm really not. And we'd go ahead and pitch the incense anyway. Because we couldn't imagine that God would actually want us to die for him. That's crazy. Why would God want us to die for him? I mean, I've got bills to pay. I've got a family. I've got a this. I've got a that. Why would God ever want that of me? And we have two martyrs right on that table that did so as an example to us. Blessed Bishop Goydich and Blessed Bishop Hopko, who stood, who stood until they died. But we, oh man, we want to, we want to massage that system. You see this in 2 Maccabees, in where the Greeks were making the Jews. They hated the Jews, they were killing them, and they were making them apostat, apostatize, 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 apostatize themselves uh, anyway, by eating pork. They would force them to eat pork. If they didn't, they would torture them mercilessly. There was this guy named Phineas, an old man, who all the Greeks liked. He was a Jew. And they came to him and they said, look, you know what? We'll tell you what. I'll tell you what we'll do, Phineas. We like you. So when you have to eat the pork tomorrow, you can bring any meat you want. So you really won't be eating pork tomorrow in front of everybody. You'll know in your own heart that you really haven't violated the law. But of course, everybody in the audience would think that he did. He refused. And they tortured him worse than anybody because it made them so angry that he refused their way. So do you see where that is? Because we just think that God wouldn't want anything but our comfort. God wouldn't want anything but my convenience. God wouldn't want anything but to make me happy 
in the way that I want to be happy, which is to live in a nice neighborhood with a whole bunch of stuff, a couple, three cars in the garage, 10,000 or more in the bank, have my retirement. Oh my gosh, come on. So I retire with more income than I work with. I mean, isn't that it? Isn't Christianity this upward, upward thing that we become more and more happy and healthy and perfect and whole? Isn't that Christianity? How do you reconcile that kind of Christianity with that Christianity that's on that cross? That is a descendancy, a spiral to death. But the spiral to death is the self-gift of love. And in that self-gift of love, that spiraling to death in love, is where we find ourselves and we find everything. Time and time and time and time and time again, you can look at the suicide rates, and suicide rates are higher than the wealthy neighborhoods than the, cheap, the poor ones. Give me. I, have, I used to teach teenagers, I asked them this, this question, I'll ask you. How many, uh, tell me this, answer me this question. <clears throat> Who do you think is happier, Mother Teresa or Bill Gates? How many say Mother Teresa? Okay, now let me ask you a question. Who would you rather be, Mother Teresa or Bill Gates? Uh, <laughs> ah, every one of you. I'd sit in front of these kids and say, who's happier, Mother Teresa? Who do you want to be, Bill Gates? <laughs> And they'd be like, okay. <laughs> Where are you trying to one more time? Who's happier, Mother Teresa? Who do you want to meet, Bill Gates? It's like, so you're telling me you want to be rich and unhappy? What kind of sense does that make? What kind of sense does that make? <laughs> so God didn't bring us into this wilderness to die. He brought us here to show, to reveal himself to us. He brought us here to do good to us, to bring us to this promised land. But at the same time, for God to do good to us, the best, you know what the best thing God can do for you? Is to show you yourself. To show you how sinful you are so that you can repent and be forgiven and be healed and begin to grow closer to Him. The worst thing God could ever do to you is to say, I'm done. Nothing worse than that. So when you look at the people around you who seem to be doing all these bad things, and yet good things, and get good things, what we call good things, like they have the house, they have the job, they have the promotion, they have the favor of the boss, they have whatever, and we sit there and think, geez, God, don't you love me? Because if you love me, I'd do that. That's not favor. This flows from Calvinism. It flows from the fact that Calvin taught that there was people that God chose, that God willed to go to heaven, and he willed people to go to hell. And that people that he willed to go to heaven, you couldn't know who they were. It was a spiritual church. But the way you know is how, because God would bless them like he did Job and like he did Abraham with stuff. So the more stuff you got, the more blessed by God you were, the more chosen you were by God. Well, that's antithetical to the gospel. And we're going to hear that in the reading today in the Gospel Day of the Good Samaritan. Okay? Okay. Yes, Michael. Yes, Michael. So, we're going to stop. We're going to stop and have our first break. Um, we're quite behind. But that's my problem. Not yours. I think it's been good. We're going to go right in then when we get back. We'll go right in and we'll catch these first two stops on the way of the of this exodus because I think I set it up enough that we can just really move right through them and be able to kind of with laser focus see what's going on.